Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Jo Beale and I'm an Emeritus Professor and what they call a Distinguished Policy Fellow in LSE Cities. And it's my great pleasure tonight to chair this uh, public lecture, which will be given um, by Professor Tom Goodfellow. And he will be talking um, about his, his new book, which has just come out with Cambridge University Press. And um, I will not say very much about it because you'll have an opportunity to hear from him and our distinguished panelists. Tom um, works on the comparative political economy of urban development and urban change in Africa. Uh, and he explores these issues through things like housing and infrastructure, property and taxation. And I, I would say that he has really pushed the frontiers both of politics and urban studies through his work. Um, he will speak for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then I will ask our two panelists to respond. And then we'll open it up for questions. I'm going to introduce our panelists now so I don't interrupt the flow. On my left is James Putzel. James is a professor in international development here at the um, LSE and between 2000 and 2011 was director of the Crisis States program uh, and, it, and indeed it was on this program with its urban arm that Tom developed uh, some of this uh, work in its early stages. James is known for his work on agrarian reform in the Philippines and elsewhere, and his research on social capital, democratization, and the political economy of development. Um, on my right is Claire Mercer from the Department of Geography here at uh, LSE. And uh, her current research examines the relationship between property and socio-spatial change uh, with a focus on urban Africa. She's completing a book project exploring the significance of property to the middle classes and middle class reproduction in suburban Dar es Salaam. Uh, and we look forward to hearing her insights, uh, both on, from her own work and her thoughts on Tom's. Uh, before I hand over to Tom, there's a bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those, first of all, to switch off your mobile phones so that you don't um, disturb the recording of this, uh, which, uh, if all goes well, will be available afterwards, um, So as long as there's no technical diff difficulties, like your phone's going off. Um, and for those of you who use Twitter, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Urban, Urban with a capital letter. So without any further ado, James, Claire and I are going to go and sit in the front row and hand over to Tom. And I'm sure we're really going to enjoy what he has to say. That's Tom. Thank you very much, Joe, um, for your generous introduction. Um, I should say a couple of things. Firstly, Joe is a little bit biased. She didn't mention this, but she was my PhD supervisor along with Jenny <laughs> when I was here. So uh, I'm going to come around here, I think, because I uh, don't know if you're looking up there. I'd rather engage with my slides like this. Uh, the other thing Just is, check you can be heard for the uh, recording. Okay, I could sit back here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't want to get anything wrong. Well, well, no, I should also point out that it's also actually Oxford University Press rather than Cambridge because we might get in trouble. Very good. No, no, no problem. Uh, so thank you. And it is really, really wonderful to be here. I'm very grateful for you all to come in. Uh, and obviously, this is you know, it's a sort of homecoming because this is where I, I did my PhD in the Department of International Development, where James is based and Joe was previously based. Um, who are co-hosting this event. Uh, but also, as Joe said, I was involved with a group of people, including some who are in this audience, Sean and Lucy, uh, in a program called the Crisis States Research Program that was really formative for me uh, and extremely important in getting me started on a PhD that Joe and James were, were leading at that time. So, yeah, I, it's hard for me to just talk about the books. I'm not really I'm not going to talk that much about the book in detail because 
It's quite a big book. Maybe James or Claire will say something about the book. But I'm going to sort of say how I got there and how this evolved out of my PhD. And I'm going to show quite a lot of photographs because thinking about this talk, I went back um, through photographs from my early PhD film work and subsequent field trips to different parts of East Africa. And in some ways, I want to tell the story of the book through those photographs because you take all these things and you know it's nice to have an excuse to use them. And I think it's a way of expressing uh, some of the arguments of the book without hopefully getting bogged down in too much detail or too many words. This is a picture from the peripheries of Addis Ababa, uh, where they were in the process of building one of the many, many, many units of condominium housing funded by the government, um, uh, which I'll say more about in due course. So this book um, focuses on the region of East Africa. And I want to say a little bit about why I'm talking about East Africa as a region, what that means, why that's an appropriate focus, how we define East Africa, rather than, for example, just talking about one or two countries where I have to do some research, or three countries specifically, because this book largely focuses on three. This is an image um, produced by my former colleague, Alistair Ray, who is like a real map guru, and he said I could use it in the book. It's what they call a uh, population spike, a population density spike map. By the way, there's no more of that fancy movie spike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, there's one, there's one more. Uh, but this shows the area of the highest population density in Africa. And I think what's really interesting about this is firstly, it's quite evident that outside of a significant area in West Africa, around Nigeria and Ghana and, and those places where you have high densities of population, the real population densities in Africa outside of there are in Eastern Africa, but also specifically in the Ethiopian highlands, which is uh, up here, and then around Lake Victoria, the Great Lakes region, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, parts of the Congo and Tanzania. Uh, I, I partly put this up as a justification in a way for me we're focusing on these countries because mm, when you say East Africa, a lot of people think of Kenya or Tanzania, which are large countries. They're, they're well known. They're relatively well studied. They're obviously very significant. And I don't really talk about those countries at all. I'm, I'm talking about these other countries which are within the region and I argue experience some of the same forces shaping them, uh, but they have quite different stories uh, to tell. The other thing that's interesting about this map is there's an irony here. Uh, I'm sure someone like Sean could say many more, much more intelligent things about this, but even though you see these population clustering in those countries, they're also the least urbanized countries in Africa. So this is, although the definitions of urban can be contested, and this is uh, interesting work that Sean is doing, um, this is a rural density, much of it. So the reason I'm interested in these, this region is not simply because there's lots of people there clustered together, but because it's a, it's a very uh, relatively unurbanized region that is rapidly becoming urban very fast. And this, I think, is what makes it a particularly interesting place to study cities and how they're changing. So a few more maps, uh, which are a bit less exciting, but show significant things. So this is a typical map of urbanization levels around the world, uh, which shows the percentage of the population living in urban areas. And you can see there quite clearly that Eastern Africa is the region with very high, well, very low levels of urbanization. And I would say that the most significant clustering of lowly urbanized countries anywhere. Uh, so I frame the book around this, this argument that it is the least urbanized region of the world, but also the fastest urbanizing. So this data here shows you the regions of the world, how, how quickly uh, the population is becoming more urban. So the rate of growth of urban relative to rural population. And what you can see here is that compared to all these other regions, which are all urbanizing, quite significantly. Eastern Africa, which is a thick black line, uh, has, you know, since over the last 50, 60 years, uh, overall been the highest, uh, most rapidly urbanizing. So we see here a region that is densely populated, it has low levels of urbanization, but very rapidly that's changing, which makes it uh, an exciting <coughs> place. And I use the term in the first chapter, the peripheral frontier. Now, I could say quite a lot about this word frontier, that had I, could I go back five years or so, I might not use that word in the title of my book because it's being used so much within urban studies, usually to mean something very different. People are talking about, uh, in perhaps a more obvious way, the frontier of a particular city. So the periphery, where land is being converted into urban uses. So people, including Claire, are doing very interesting work on the suburban frontier and the, the frontier as a kind of periphery. Whereas what I'm talking about is something quite different. I'm saying this whole region, is the kind of global urban frontier where we're seeing the fastest change towards urban living 
Um, but at the same time, it's peripheral in the sense that it's not a big part of debates on urbanization. You don't hear many people talking about Rwanda or Uganda when they're talking about planetary urbanization or, or anything else to do with you know, urban development very often. So it's on the periphery of these debates, uh, and it's, it's, it's a low level of urbanization, but actually it's where the things have changed in the fastest. But it's also significant that Eastern Africa is, has a kind of coherence, including in the way it markets itself, uh, the, the histories of colonialism, the relationships both with, with Western donors, which are long-standing and very significant, bringing in a large amount of um, you know, funding to many of the governments in the region. Uh, but also, it's a pivotal place in terms of the Chinese Belt and Road strategy and how that enters into Africa. So, what you can see here is you know, these lines of transport that are connecting the coast to the interior. And this is something that goes back to colonial times, but it's now very much a part of that Chinese um, influence within Africa. So, it has all of these reasons. Uh, it also shows up in a lot of data on investment in things like property, real estate, construction, as having particularly high amounts of investment in those sectors, even though relatively low investment in other sectors of the economy. So there's something going on there that is distinctive and interesting that I wanted to explore. So I wanted to say my bit there on East Africa. Now I'm going to go back to essentially the start of my PhD and the kind of journey in a way I've been on to write this book. And I should say that um, the acknowledgments in this book are substantial. I think it's about five pages of them. Because even though it's a monograph, you know, there were so many people uh, and experiences that contributed to this in different ways, and starting with my PhD and my supervisor, but extending deep into the countries where I was doing research. I arrived in Kampala having never been in Uganda or in, in that part of Africa, and just was kind of overwhelmed by the, the urban... Uh, the vibrancy, the chaos, the apparent uh, lack of any sense of law, or regulation, or planning, um, and just sought to understand this a little more. But I was always thinking about this comparatively as well, because um, following in a line of uh, PhD students of James and Joe who had done comparative work, I wanted to do something comparative. But it was only when I then stepped over the border into Rwanda that I started to realize how significant and interesting to me that comparison could be. This is a slide that I used to use a lot in my early PhD presentation, so I thought I'd bring it out one last time, <laughs> which shows, uh, uh, and it's, it's a very serious and, and sad story in many ways, although very common. This is an um, informal settlement very close to the city centre of Kigali, the old city centre, that was um, in around 2007, before I began my research, was uh, effectively raised uh, to the ground uh, in the interest of building this supposed new CBD. So this was the, the new Central Business District plan. I was there when they launched this plan in 2009 because I happened to be doing my field work and the, um, it was American and Singaporean uh, planners and architects who designed the city centre. But at the time, and until quite recently, it, it basically looked like this. And even now, you see some structures here, mostly government buildings who bought these large blocks but the anticipated investment into the city to transform it into some kind of new Singapore or um, Dubai uh, had not come in. And this is partly to do with the size of the plots, the cost of the land, but effectively what you'd see was these scars on the landscape where space was clear, where the population was moved away uh, in a way that was sort of unimaginable in Kampala, where there seemed to be population, activity, housing everywhere. So, I mean, this is another fairly well used image from the Kigali Master Plan. I think Vanessa Watson um, used this in her very well known piece on African urban fantasies. But at the time, which was before she wrote that article, you know, there were people working in the Kigali City Council. I think this was an advisor from elsewhere in Africa who worked for UN Habitat who said, you know, this is this is not a real design for the real city. It's a virtual design for another city rather than the Kigali that actually exists. So there was this sense that Kigali was completely trying to reimagine itself and having some significant success in transforming the city in a way that seemed impossible or undesirable in Kampala. Um, and this was one of the things I sought to understand. Now this, because I've just shown some snapshots here from my early research to begin with, um, this was a diagram drawn for me by a former soldier in the Rwandan army who had been demobilized and didn't really have a job. Um, 
showing a detention centre that has been written about extensively by Human Rights Watch, where people would be taken off the street in Kigali and detained if they were engaging in sex work, if they were street children, or even sometimes if they were just trading um, illegally against the urban regulations in place. And the reason I'm showing this is not because it's necessarily highly reliable, this is just one source, I can't vouch for, for what this centre was like, although it is very much echoed what he said in the Human Rights Watch reports. It's the way he talks about the government's idea and attitude towards traders. He makes this point that they have this Vision 2020, which was part of the grand vision for Rwanda and Kigali, and yet they treat people uh, you know, like something from hundreds of years ago, and say to these traders, we don't want some more traders in the city. The government doesn't need you. And this, in a comparative mindset with Kampala, is really quite striking, because it seemed like over there in Kampala, the government really did need these people. They were constantly intervening to protect them from regulations. They were trying to mobilize votes from them. They were building support among them. There was a sense that these people were important politically to the government in a way that they simply weren't in Kampala. And so I was intrigued how you could have a whole group of people who are sort of disposable in one place and apparently really necessary in another place over the border that has many uh, similarities in terms of socioeconomic profile and history. So in Kigali, just to show a few more images from the time, you would constantly see this clearing of space, the turned earth of houses that have been knocked down, often without anything new being built for a long period of time, is a very common feature. Again, this is from my research like 12 years ago, so bear that in mind. This, this is a hillside that was cleared 2009 or 10, where something like 3,000 households were removed. This was partly built on with a very, very, very fancy, expensive real estate project which even most Rwandans, um, including elite Rwandans, admit it was way beyond the reach of most ordinary people in the country. Um, so in thinking about this kind of contrast, I was quite struck by things that people said, and one phrase that jumped out of me when, for, for me when doing uh, research in Kampala City Council. So I spent some months like, haunting the corridors of the City Council in Kampala and in Kigali. And uh, a woman uh, who was an officer responsible for uh, organizing marketplaces and trying to arrange trade in the city kept using this phrase, we are on the low bargaining side. She said, oh yeah, we want to arrange them into these markets and we want to kind of stop all this trade happening in the middle of the street, but we're on the low bargaining side. I'm very curious. She was trying to say that, you know, as a city government, we have very little power in this kind of game. I mean, the idea that you would, you would talk about that as bargaining, you know, your, your role in the governance of the city was, was pretty interesting. But also, over in Kigali, it's clearly these people, the traders who are on the low bargaining side, who have to sneak out at night, who have to creep around and often get detained or sent out of the city violently. So again, that contrast was very strong and was clearly something that was rooted in the politics of what was going on in this country. So, so far, so my PhD, right? This is the kind of stuff I was worrying about in my PhD, which I finished in 2012. Uh, a few years later, I did a research project in, in Addis Ababa, which was a comparative study around urban land, um, kind of urban land policy and property taxation. Because I've realized in the course of my PhD, partly encouraged by James particularly on this, that looking at tax is quite an interesting way to understand what's really going on. Right? and what the political economy is of the place, who the powerful players are, how they arrange themselves institutionally to resist reforms, and so on. And so after my PhD, I followed up, by, because I was interested in Addis, because again, the city that I heard was really changing very fast. But I was you know, really flawed. When I arrived there in 2014, the scale of construction, uh, transformation of the built environment, was like nothing I had seen in Kampala or Kigali. And it was extraordinary. It was hard to even move around the city because there was so much being turned up and rebuilt. And unlike Kigali, that mostly wasn't some houses being knocked down and then left for long periods of time. It was huge amounts of investment going into the built environment, going into infrastructure, housing, all kinds of things. So any sense I might have had of like, here's a nice little neat comparison I'm going to do, was really complexified by this in a way that I found ultimately to be very productive because it encouraged me to think beyond the kind of binary of two cities um, in the way that I had been. Completely different to the other two cities. You, know, you would see this massive housing program with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of houses being built, paid for upfront by the government, and then um, 
you know, released through a lottery scheme to residents who eventually have to pay because they don't get them free like in South Africa. But this was, there was nothing like this happening in the other cities. This kind of infrastructure, massive investments in transport infrastructure, which, although this has been quite problematic, is used by large numbers of very poor people in the city every day. You would never see this kind of investment in the other countries. And it wasn't that they were richer, per capita, in fact. I mean, it wasn't that Ethiopia was richer, but per capita, it was still somewhat poorer. But there was something very different going on in terms of the plans for the city and the ability to realize them in that city. So, I have very few slides with words on, but this is one. <laughs> um, in thinking about explaining these different urban outcomes, urban trajectories, I find that the dominant theories within urban studies and urban theory are not terribly helpful to me. So, you know, when writing this book, I situate it, or attempt to situate it, at the kind of intersection of urban studies and development studies, because that's, that's my background, and that's reflected in this event, right, which is co-hosted by ID and Cities. But I did find that most of my um, theoretical engagement and critique, in a way, is directed around the kind of urban studies space, uh, because perhaps, because that's where I've been embedded in the last few years in Sheffield. But also, I wanted to do something that focused on the city scale. But these um, big debates that are going on about, you know, is urbanization a planetary phenomenon? Do we, do we need to think of the urban beyond the borders of the city? What does it mean to do so? Yes, that's fine. But it doesn't tell me anything about the difference between these three cities, which seems to be very consequential differences, right? People are either able to pursue a livelihood or not. They have a house or they don't. Um, and similarly, you might turn to the literature around neoliberalism and the ways in which it lands in different places differently. So this refers to the literature by people like Peck and Theodore, uh, among others, who kind of make the argument that neoliberalism is, is everywhere, but it lands in these different regulatory institutional landscapes and you get different kinds of outcomes. Fair enough, I don't disagree with that in a sense, but it seems to me to subsume everything within the neoliberalism argument in ways that are quite problematic when actually quite a lot of what's going on in these countries is not necessarily neoliberal. There are other agendas that really compete with those neoliberal ones. And there are also countries that have the same, more or less, li regulatory neoliberal frameworks in, like Rwanda and Uganda, much of it similar. But the outcomes are very different. So again, that seems to be insufficient, as perhaps, more obviously, does an idea of southern urbanism, which kind of, in a sense, generalizes about um, cities of the south. And I'm sympathetic to the idea that cities in the global south have some distinctiveness. And uh, Sean and I have written about this and kind of tried to say that it's not only about being southern, uh, there's also a significance of when countries are urbanizing in the historical suite of history. But again, this doesn't explain the differences between the three countries and cities that I was seeking to explain. So, <laughs> this brings me to the title of the book in a way, which is that I, I guess I, I may have come with a, pre, um, a prejudged idea that politics was part of the story. I'm prepared to admit that because I was interested in politics and my background is in it. But it also seemed very clear to me that the difference is there was a political story to be told about the differences. It's not just about how much money they have, how much investment they're getting from China or something like that, or the size of the city. There's definitely something more to it as far as I could tell. And I'm showing this picture. I should probably explain why I'm showing this picture. It's partly because I, when I was speaking to a colleague about the title of the book, he's... Uh, you know, I think people perhaps think at first it might be politics on the urban frontier or at the urban frontier, which again, I didn't really want because I didn't want people to think I was talking about the specific like urban periphery that space. And I thought well, that might give the impression. But also, it's this idea of like, yeah, so he said, my colleague, he said, oh, it's like Adam and the Ants. You know, so you, <laughs> you've got like a, some kind of front person who's driving the story. And in some sense, that's, that's what it's like. Like politics is at the center of what I'm trying to do in, in explaining what's happening here. So I kept, kept the Adam. Um, and the other thing, which again I think indicates that the critique is somehow more leveled at the urban studies current debates than development studies ones, although it does engage with some of those, a, a lot of what's going on in urban theory anyway, in urban studies, is kind of richly descriptive. Uh, it's influenced by post-structuralist theories, actor network theory, assemblage theory, and so on. It's very valuable. We learn a lot how cities work, but it, it, it doesn't deal with causality, really. It, it almost explicitly rejects telling a causal story. And I really wanted to tell a causal story. So I'm trying to put that back in the center here. Um, 
And also, when I talk about politics, you know, there's a tendency in a lot of debates to talk about politics as being kind of these emancipatory movements that exist far away from the state, and they're about liberation from the structures of formal governance, and that's where politics is. This is a kind of Ranciarian idea of politics. But to me, that's also not really what I'm talking about, because the politics that you see intersects the state. It's hard to pull these things apart. It's about elite conflict over what the state is and does. It's not just about these movements that happen somewhere far away. So when I talk about politics, I'm talking about it in that sense and how it helps us to understand causality. And the other thing that I do is, is look at this in relation to scales of analysis. There's a lot of debates in geography. I discovered all this literature on scale. Oh my God, I couldn't read it all. Uh, including stuff that says, you know, scale is dead. It doesn't mean anything anymore. But um, that's worth the independence there. But from my perspective, there are things going on here that are quite distinctively regional in nature as a set. Some of the ways in which investment is coming in, the ways in which um, the, these countries have grown together through movements, through conflicts, through population dynamics. So there's a regional story, but that doesn't explain the differences within. There's also a national story and a city level story. Um, so I don't just want to look at the city level, and I'm drawing there, you know, there's a, a, there's a literature long standing that critiques kind of methodological nationalism in development studies and in political economy. Everyone just talks about the national level. Whereas in urban studies, there's sometimes this methodological cityism, uh, where cities are treated independently. So in looking at these different scales, I'm trying to um, link them together and go beyond. I was struck by this term that these famous urban geographers, in a very useful book, Seeing Like a City, they use the term urban force. Uh, and they talk about the, the things that drive the city and happen in the city are assembled within the city, right? It all happens, it's all about forces within the city. Uh, whereas to me, we do need to look outside. We need to understand the things that act on the city, right? It's not all about um, the urban force, but the broader causal force. Anyway, I'll stop talking about causality now. <laughs> but um, I draw on critical realist ideas, basically, to say, you know, it's not about finding the one cause. It's not about reducing this to, or, or having a very clear idea, necessarily, about hierarchy of causes. But it's recognizing that there are complex, multiple causes to things like different forms of urban development, and they rub up against each other uh, in particular ways at particular times. So in thinking about how to explain the cause of the differences between these cities, I basically have an analytical framework that I boil down to four things. Uh, this was a process of kind of distilling, in a way, the things that I thought were fundamental down to the minimum number, which happens to be four. Um, and the first of those is the distribution of what I call the distribution of associational power. Now, this is where I draw most heavily on the political settlements framework, which James has you know, been involved in for a long time, and to some extent informed the price of stakes extent of work. But I'm not drawing on all of that. I'm here just interested in essentially the question of the distribution of power among politically salient groups in a country, uh, and how that affects what, what gets invested in, what gets resisted, how effective that resistance is. And in drawing on the um, critical realist kind of framing here is this idea of this uh, idea of emergence, which is that simply explaining why groups of people might have a force, a power that individuals don't. They're more than the sum of their parts. In coming together as a group, uh, you can act in ways that are very significant. This is a picture of some motorbikes. Again, I'll probably explain that that's because of quite a lot of the work I've done, although it's not so much in this book, talks about these motorcycle taxi drivers and other transport workers who often can be a really powerful force in preventing regulations from even being made, uh, in making sure they're not enforced, in organizing voting, in communicating with different groups around the city. So that's just one example. We could be talking about students or landowners or you know, uh, investors and owners of major industrial enterprises. But this distribution of power between groups is very specific in different countries and cities. And so that's, in a sense, the first factor in the framework. However, this is not, it's not sufficient in a way to just look at who has the power, even though you can obviously debate that for a long time. You also need to look at what the ideas are uh, and, the, and the agenda, in a sense, is of people in power and what they see <coughs> and why. Right? They're not just responding to a distribution of power and saying, you're powerful, I'll do this. They also have ideas that there are discourses that motivate them. There are ideologies. And in particular, they need to legitimize their rule, particularly because we're talking about countries which are not very democratic, to put it mildly, but they still need to legitimate themselves. They're, they're under serious threat 
of political um, mobilization against them for all kinds of historical and contemporary reasons. But again, you see this legitimation happen in totally different ways. So why is a housing program so, somehow so important as a project of legitimation in Ethiopia, which many people have argued actually, whereas it's not in the other city. In somewhere like Kigali, the ordering of the city, the conformity to rules, the cleanliness. This is Umuganda, which is an event that happens on like the first Friday of every month, where everybody participates in public works. And at the same time, it's, it's a way for government to communicate things to the population and keep, keep an eye on them, essentially. And then there in Kampala, it seemed like the, the legitimacy was acquired by letting people just do what they want, by you know, fostering a vibrant dynamism in the economy and then supporting anybody who wants to escape from the regulations of the state. So in that aspect, I draw on the American political scientist Alicia Holland's work on forbearance, this idea that you, you revoke the law, you withhold the law intentionally and temporarily to build some political support. So it's not that you can't enforce it, it's that you choose not to for political reasons. And this is something that is very resonant with Kampala, but not so much with the other cities. So the third aspect of the framing is around this idea of political informality, which I've written a paper on. And essentially it's about social norms and institutions. So it's, I, you know, I find I can't explain these differences just by who has the power and what the government wants to do to legitimate itself. You also need to look at society. You need to look at what the social norms are, how do people behave. This is another image from Kigali where you see uh, motorcycle taxi workers who organize themselves to do public works. This is not exactly required of them by some official policy, but they just do it. There's a, there's a lot of conforming, there's a lot of desire to fit in with the formal rules in place because you can basically survive better that way than if you try to resist formal rules. Whereas in Kampala, I mean, I just found that picture and thought it was quite funny because it's a, it's a microcosm of the situation of where you have rules, but they almost exist to be broken, to be bargain over, to use that phrase, which is not the case at all in, in Rwanda, for example. Um, and in developing that idea of political informality, I also draw Charles Tilly, who was influential to all of us back here uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, this idea of trust networks. It's like, how do you, how do you um, build networks of trust between people, and do you incorporate them within the state or, or not? Whereas in Kigali, for example, there's this idea that you try and bring everything under the state. So um, all of politics is kind of within your, your control. Fourth, and finally, is um, what I call legacies and practices of infrastructural reach. And this is me kind of acknowledging and engaging with some of that literature on infrastructure that comes out of critical geography, anthropology, urban studies, um, that looks at the power that infrastructure has. Uh, I shouldn't say power, but um, I don't do that in the book. But the force that infrastructure has in its own right to shape the city. Because once you have these particularly large mega projects, they kind of exert their own influence over things. And you can't just reduce that to who designed them, because often the design um, is only partial, it's a composite of different interests, and it isn't realized. So there's this idea of infrastructural vitality that comes out of that literature. But I don't go as far as to say, oh, that means it has agency, and you know, infrastructure kind of controls everything in some way, like some kind of subterranean um, beast. Um, I try and bring together that idea with Michael Mann's idea of infrastructural power which is very different, right? That's about the power that the state has to go and implement things, right? So man makes this distinction, many of you might know this, but he talks about the difference between despotic power and infrastructural power. So the despotic power of the state is their ability to say, the example is from Alice in Wonderland, right? So go and find Alice to chop off her head. I can say that, and you have to do it. But then to actually find her, to track her down and chop off her head, you need a different kind of power, and that's infrastructural power. And to me, these things are often quite connected. So in somewhere like Rwanda, there are high levels in infrastructural power in the state because of its history, which I explore in a chapter. But at the same time, that means you have one of the most dense road networks now, because it's been able to implement that. And then you have infrastructures that themselves take on a bit of a life of their own. So I'm trying to look at infrastructure in a slightly more holistic way, and framing it as a kind of immediate state power. So there's normally like an agenda uh, by the state with its infrastructure, but it doesn't mediate that agenda faithfully. It may go off in different directions, and we see that in really interesting ways in Ethiopia, for example. So I will stop pretty soon. 
having kind of set out these four aspects of the framework, I then go back to this question of scale. Because to me, there's a scalar aspect to them, right? So I, you know, in contrast to what some people might think, because I'm not fully just saying this is all about neoliberalism, I do believe that advanced neoliberal forms of capitalism are very significant in everywhere uh, and in explaining some of the things going on in these cities. But that doesn't tell us much about what's regionally specific or nationally or at city level. So the regional context I frame and building on the work that I've done with Sean Fox, the paper we wrote on late urbanization, this idea that urbanizing late in historical terms is quite significant for the kinds of investment that's possible and the kinds of states uh, that you can create and so on. So that's at the regional level. And then for me, this distribution of power is something you have to consider nationally because part of the question is how powerful are the urban classes relative to the farmers, for example? You know, what, what's, what, that, that's very significant for, it was very significant in Ethiopia as you saw the power kind of move towards urban areas. The whole development plan basically changed uh, following that. So you have to see that as national. Uh, the questions of infrastructure have a national dimension and an urban one. Uh, and then I look at the kind of the, these questions of legitimation projects and the kind of dominant social norms around politics as uh, being at the city level. So that's a kind of going back to this question of framing it in relation to scales. And then there are four chapters, uh, which are the kind of core of the empirical material of the book, where I look at differences emerging in the three cities and try and explain them through that framework. So just very briefly, there's a chapter which looks at the kinds of urban visions and plans that have been coming out of the three countries and cities, uh, what explains the differences between them and the extent to which you're seeing massive investments in infrastructure to realize very different kinds of things. So here we're back in Kigali. This is a Kigali Convention Center, which is a massive conference center aiming to kind of bring in conference tourism to the region. The most expensive building in all of Africa at the time it was built in one of the poorest countries. But this was very important as a way of legitimating the, the government of Rwanda that sees itself as this business-friendly beacon for regional investment. It's very outward-facing, completely different, for example, to some of the legitimation projects elsewhere, um, and speaks very much to the power of a class of investors, foreign interests, and uh, elites in that country as a priority project. And uh, it's you know, one big major project in each of the three cities. Um, they're all very different. The next chapter looks at property scapes, or what I call urban property scapes, which is kind of what kind of housing gets built, for whom and where. Um, uh, and again, very different in, in the three cities. So in somewhere like Kigali, you see this vast oversupply uh, of high-end property, something you will see elsewhere in the region to some extent. But it was very extreme there. Well, almost nothing was being built for, um, really even for middle classes, if, 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 if that category is meaningful. Uh, let alone poorer people. Nothing like the housing schemes you see in Ethiopia. Um, and in Ethiopia, you saw this huge housing program, as I've said, while in Kampala, you didn't really see anything. Uh, you know, no, you, know, you saw property development like this, but certainly nothing being built by the state, and much more of a haphazard, unplanned, unregulated sector. So again, I tried to explain that by looking at, you know, what is the power of, of landowner, landowners relative to other groups, of poorer groups, uh, in, um, living in formal settlements, um, of middle classes and diaspora groups, and trying to understand those power relations, um, among other things, as well as the nature of informality and politics, explain some of those differences. And then we've got a chapter on basically marketplaces and street trading. So again, you see some very different uh, dynamics in terms of whether street trading is, is allowed at all, whether the marketplaces are kind of everywhere like they are in Kampala, or whether they're really confined to certain places, which is very problematic, not only for traders trying to make a living, but for people buying basic goods. So in Kigali, it's like a huge problem. People can't buy loads of stuff because there aren't enough markets. So again, trying to understand this through the prism of my analytical framing. And then the final chapter, the final empirical chapter, sort of goes full circle back to the question of politics, uh, to what I talk about as urban political registers. It's how do people engage the state within the cities? How do they express their discontent with all of these development projects or the lack of marketplaces or the wrong kinds of infrastructure? Do they go out on the streets and protest? Do they stay quiet and mobilize and then try a revolution? Um, or does nothing like that happen? Because again, there are very different dynamics in terms of how people, the, the, norm, the normal common ways in which political dissent is expressed um, in the three cities. So 
while the other three chapters are saying, you know, what is the politics that shapes these different physical, spatial transformations, this chapter is looking at how those transformations also shape, uh, play into the politics of the city itself. Um, to understand all this, I have to go back into history. So even though I'm doing this in reverse, um, that reflects in a way my journey because I wrote these historical chapters after much of the research. And it was great fun, I have to say, just going back and reading history uh, as a chapter on basically land and territory uh, and how that's constituted through pre-colonial kingdoms and colonial times and since. And then there's a chapter on urban economies that looks at how interconnections, the operations of capital, um, again through our history, have, have shaped those cities as a kind of foundation for the analysis that I provide of the contemporary dynamic. Um, this is my second last slide. So, this is somewhere where I get to in the conclusion, which I won't talk through in detail, where I try and, in a kind of simple way, map those different kinds of power. So how widely spread the distribution of power is among socioeconomic groups in each of those countries, but also how strong the infrastructural power of the state is uh, in, in terms of its ability to acquire land, to build a road, to build a house. You know, what resistance does it face? How, how does it have the leaders to do that? And at the same time, the very different kinds of legitimation strategy that you see, which are partly conditioned by these factors, but also flip back on them. So it's that, again, that critical realist thing of understanding the messy uh, tussle of different causal factors in explaining difference. To reach a few conclusions, um, I kind of make the argument that uh, although much of Africa and many other parts of the world are late urbanizers in the sense that Sean and I write about it. That's, it's, it's kind of an extreme case of late urbanization in um, Eastern Africa. And that gives it a distinctive relationship as a region to global capitalism. And yet within each country, we see very different distributions of power uh, for historical reasons. And those distributions of power are also affected by <coughs> and affect the state's infrastructural power to get things done, to realize its visions. And at the same time, led onto that, are these very different strategies of legitimation uh, and these ideas about how cities should be that are partly conditioned by experiences of war and conflict uh, and the different structures of power in those countries. And then finally, you know, there's this point about how infrastructure itself is something that you see evolving uh, in ways that are unanticipated. There are practices relating to infrastructure that can't be scripted or predicted based on those other factors. And they also have their own effect on the city. But they don't operate independently, OK? The ways in which infrastructure is perverted to different uses is also influenced by that distribution of power uh, and the modalities of political influence. And finally, that point that you know, there's a recursive relationship between politics, the registers of how urban politics is expressed, and the way that cities are transforming physically, socially, and economically. I'll leave it there. Sorry for going over. Thank you. <laughs> Sitting now. Tom, thank you so much. That was a tour de force. And uh, I know that there will be lots of people wanting to read the book. Um, feel free to plug it. I know you haven't got Oxford University Press here selling them at the back. They refuse. Uh, but if you want to plug it, do. I I'm now going to ask. Um, First, Claire, and then James to just talk for five minutes uh, about their thoughts on what Tom has said, and to perhaps throw him a couple of his first questions, and then it'll be over to you in the audience. So, Claire, go ahead. Thanks, Joe. Um, congratulations, Tom. I mean, this is such an amazing achievement to write this incredibly uh, productive book about these three very complex places you know it's it's there's so much to engage with in this book and you should all you should all read it it's it's one of the most um yeah it's just got so much in it to think about that i really encourage you to to look at it it's a really fresh approach to comparative urban analysis and i really appreciate tom's um, 
boldness in, in, in talking about causality. Uh, I think that research on African cities, especially in the last two decades or so, um, have been incredibly productive in going down other perhaps more post-structural lines, but yeah, I think that reclaiming some space for causality uh, is is needed, and Tom's book provides a really interesting way in which we can we can work with that. And I particularly like the way, obviously as a geographer, you know, you pay attention to scale. So focusing on global, regional, national, and essentially local urban dynamics and how they shape development in these three cities. Um, and I think also what's really fantastic about this book is it's, it's what Tom said about politics and the importance of politics that it's politics at the urban scale that drives what happens in specific places. And this is really, you know, to use another frontier, you know, this is really where the research frontier is, I think, in studies of African urbanism, is to try and unpick and understand urban politics uh, a little bit more. Uh, I think Tom's right in, in saying that uh, using terms like neoliberalism often obscures local politic, uh, political dynamics in particular places, um, and that paying attention to the dynamics of capital is important, but it can't tell us the whole story. Um, Tom said a little bit less about the political settlements work that comes from development studies. Um, and I think you're right to, to kind of question um, the, the, the utility of political settlements, which has tended to have a more national kind of uh, conceptual register, thinking about how political settlements are organised amongst the elite at a national scale rather than an urban, although I do, I do kind of have a, a question about that. Um, also, I really appreciate the attention to property and land. I mean, I think that those, it's kind of astonishing to say, isn't it? But I think in contemporary work on Africa, I think that um, the, the literature is really dominated by how property and land and authority and politics work in rural areas. And of course, that's important, but we need to understand a lot more about how property and land dynamics work in, in cities. So I really appreciated that about the book. So um, in this spirit of um, appreciation of the book, I do have two questions um, to, to put to you. One is, is going back to this question about political settlements. Um, can we have a political, political settlements at the city scale? <laughs> um, you know, especially as you, you, you drew out, I mean, I don't have a view on this, I'm genuinely interested. Um, you know, you pulled out that kind of really complex interscalar uh, kind of integration of, 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 of dynamics and processes in your presentation, and you also do it in more detail in the book. So what does it mean to think about political settlements at, at the city scale? And then my second question is, is about, is about the elite. Um, and obviously, the book and the presentation tells us a lot about what a focus on, on the elite as actors really important actors in urban spaces can tell us. But I also wonder, uh, does this perspective tend to foreground elite actors and see others as acting within parameters that are set by elite? So you talked in the presentation about politically salient groups. Um, and I just wondered, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not a criticism because this, such is, this book is such a tour de force and you're dealing with so many places and so many dynamics and processes that it's churlish to say, what about <laughs> another group? But I'm, I'm just kind of interested in, um, in, in how you think about what, what your analytical framework is, is, is less able, maybe, to, to, to draw attention to. And, I mean, you know where I'm coming from here. I mean, my own work is about middle class house building in, in Dar es Salaam, which is very different to the contexts that Tom talks about. Um, but what I see driving uh, the dynamics of, of who gets to use what urban space and how, it's about how people individually, through cash-based building projects, occupy land and build on it. So it's, I, I don't want to say it's outside of these elite political dynamics, but it's there's something else going on there, and I just 
kind of wonder how important maybe those kinds of dynamics are in the cities that you've talked about. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Claire. James, over to you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to comment in a slightly different vein because I want to bask in the glory of my former student. And, you know, I, I, there are four points I want to make. Yeah, and I have only five minutes to make them, so I'll try to be, I'll try to be concise. There's nothing that gives me more pleasure in my career than when the student becomes the teacher, and this is the process I've witnessed. You know, so that my first point is, it's ten years since Tom submitted his PhD, almost almost ten years. No, just beyond ten years, yeah. actually, June. 2012. And it, you know, it's, I'm really proud to have contributed just a little bit to the stellar career that has evolved since. So I encourage you not only to read this book, but the raft of articles and the results of research projects that Tom has been working on. And you know, reading the book now uh, reminded me of what a great pleasure it is to read Tom. I mean, very seldom you say that. that I had forgotten. I just don't love to read his draft chapters, unlike a lot of PhD <laughs> students. Um, he's a beautiful writer. And, you know, when he started, this hasn't been mentioned yet, but when he was on the cusp of deciding whether to apply to the ESRC to do a PhD, he had been working with us in crisis states. And we tried to convince him to. He was on the cusp of a music career. Yeah, and perhaps if a certain record deal had come through, he wouldn't be sitting here. But So there was a choice there, but Tom's musical sense resonates throughout this text. Um, and, and his explanation of the marketplaces, the, the infrastructural creation in the cities in different, in different ways to, to great differing results, the, the lived reality of people in Kigali and Kampala and Addis really, really come through. Ten years, it's like a good whiskey. Yeah, you know, a, a whiskey in ten years matures and becomes more sophisticated, more complex. Um, and in fact, this book is more like a 40 year, 40 year whiskey, you know, because of the, because of the depth of analysis it achieves. And in fact, you know, I, I was, you know, you seldom see this. This was not 10 years sp spent sitting around and saying, you know, I should get back to my PhD and publish it and, you know, maybe finally do it. Very different. So the 10 years allowed the addition of an entirely new case study in, in looking at, at, at Addis. And it permitted longitudinal analysis through the work that he had started in his PhD, returning to those cities, and it permitted the maturation of his theoretical understanding of the topic. I mean, it was a fantastic PhD. It was passed and lauded at the time, but this is, you know, a further leap forward, and indeed of methodology. In the addition of the of Addis in the study, he mentioned this briefly in his talk, brought, you know, a real uh, power to his comparative analysis, moving away, as he says in the book, from kind of thinking of comparison as binary explanations. And it was a fabulous move to do that, I think, and brought a great deal more insight into the work. So that's my first point. Let me try to be briefer on some of my second ones and third. This is really a book anchored in the political economy of development. So I'm going to claim him for development studies. And it realizes a lot of what we set out to do 30 years ago in establishing development studies at the LSE. So this is a real example of interdisciplinary work here. And again, I mean, Tom, we'll see instruments derived from history, sociology, uh, not only urban, you know, urban development and, uh, and development studies, really like the conductor of a philharmonic orchestra. Uh, and sorry for all the allusions to his music. Um, 
that political economy analysis comes across in what he spoke to. Now I don't need to go into detail because you've given your talk about urban frontiers. I think it's an, a, a really important idea in the book. His, his, his analysis uh, transcending, understanding the legacies of neoliberalism on urban development, but transcending the limits that look at urban development only within those confines of neoliberalism. So there's a real political economy analysis in, in this. The third thing is he, this book represents the best of the traditions of the LSC in seeking the causes of things. So the causal explanation, he went through it with his fact, you know, with his his explanatory framework looking at associational power, so the pursuit of social legitimacy, legitimacy, the modalities of political informality and the legacies and practices of infrastructural reach that harnessing Michael Mann's notion of infrastructural power and urban studies understanding of infrastructure. And now, finally, my fourth point, and I'll finish on this. I'll let you answer Claire's questions. I won't go in with others because perhaps the audience has questions. Finally, Tom's purpose, as it came to be defined um, in the course of his PhD research and his work with us in Crisis States program, uh, comes through in the book, his social commitment is driving his scholarship you know, Tom's research left a really important impact on me when he was explaining and looking at what seemed to be the very effective or efficient um, uh, governance of Kigali. Yeah. And he suggested that what was happening was the creation of a pressure cooker, a pressure cooker among different social groups in 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 Rwanda and in, in Kigali, that were likely to explode in the future, and he was able to witness that kind that creation of that kind of pressure in Addis Ababa. I think you were able to bring to fruition some of that understanding, and that's a notion really important right now. If we look at the kind of um, the kind of urban protests that are going on across Iran or across China right today, right now. Um, and I think the insights of that are extremely important. Um, you know, this, the, he, his purpose in this work um, is really summed up by his intention, which I think he goes a long way in doing, and will continue, I'm sure, to, uh, with this, to contribute to more socially just and equitable urban futures. So. I'm quite proud to be have some small connection with this guy. <laughs> Thanks very much, Claire and James. Um, it's now my pleasure to open up the floor to all of you. Um, can you? There's a roving mic. Um, when you uh, address your question, can you let us know? <coughs> your name and affiliation and wait for the mic to get to you. While I collect some hands, I've just got... I can respond to Claire if you like while, while you wait. Or... Why don't you do that? Okay. Um, no. Can I just get a sense of how many hands are going to leap up? Okay. A, a brief response to Claire. Yeah, I mean, it's... Oh, the political settlement stuff, it's interesting um, because I don't... I mean, I found that very fruitful to work with this. You know, I've written about it myself and trying to think about that at the city scale. Uh, I found that when, I, when trying to think about political settlement at the city scale, I sort of gave up and found it too hard because the national was so... Mm -hmm. Because I'm looking at capital cities. Mm -hmm. In capital cities, the national mm -hmm. politics is, can't be separated from the city politics very easily. So I ended up writing a paper that wanted to be about political settlement at the city scale, but ended up being about how national political settlements played out in the city. Now, if you want to... If, it, if some people are working on this, right, and they're working on it specifically in the African Cities Research Consortium in Beta at Manchester, so they talk about, they were also struggling with this, can we talk about political settlement at the city scale? And I think they concluded, again, it's kind of too hard. So they talk about political settlement, and then they talk about the city-level balance of power as being something different. 
and they look at the relationship between those, which I don't really do in this. Um, but more generally, I mean, I wasn't, I'm just going to grab, I've got a couple of copies of the book, which I did sort of hand out. They gave me a few. They're so expensive, <laughs> otherwise I'd give them, you know, but um, if anyone wants to look, but it's no, because Franklin of England, who's an amazing scholar um, of urban West Africa mostly, gave me a nice quote. He says in it, he says, oh, you know, this is a, this is a great application of the political question. <coughs> I don't really see the book as being, let me put these here in case anyone wants to look pictures and stuff. Um, I don't see it as being like that central. It's right? just one thing, but I didn't want to make it too much about that because it doesn't help me with everything I want to do. Yeah. yeah. OK, um, I saw a hand right at the back. Can you put your hand up again and remember to say who you are and what your affiliation is? Um, hi, I'm Ragini. Thank you very much for the presentation, Tom. Um, it was incredibly interesting. Um, I'm doing my PhD um, in urban studies at the University of Warwick. Um, and I guess my question kind of builds on Claire because this is primarily what I was thinking of when you were presenting in, especially since you phrase your um, project as being one of causality. I feel like, okay, judging by the cities I'm fam familiar with, a lot of the decisions about how to build cities and how to do things actually depend on the institutional governance structure of that specific city and the extent to which sort of decision-making power is situated within different institutions, how decentralized or not decentralized this tends to be. And I think this is important not just because there is a city sort of um, a city-specific bias within urban studies, but within countries themselves as well. Cities are treated as specific and special entities in national politics. So I'm just wondering how we can um, sort of incorporate the importance of that institutional specificity of cities in terms of governance structures. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. I'm going to take a couple, Tom. Um, anybody else? Philip. Yeah, we're going to keep keep you um, fit there with the mic. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Rhoda from LSE Cities. So this wonderful evening coincides with the Urban Analytics Week of the Executive Masters in Cities, and there are about uh, 15 colleagues uh, in the classroom listening. Uh, and of course, I have to then also come back to the very great boldness, and I have to congratulate you on that with the causality, which was just talked about, and also Claire mentioned this. I think for our students, it's less clear how radical you are uh, in your own community, daring to use a term which uh, has you know, almost a bad reputation. But I, I think it would be really interesting to hear a bit more about how you then defend the ambition also methodologically. How you, how you, what are you doing differently that allows you to claim that or reclaim that territory from the positivistic disciplines? Um, that would be interesting. And I'm also curious to understand, you know, if you create this long list, we can all imagine these cityscapes of uh, these three cities you talked about. They look very differently. And you can then sit at night, if you know them, uh, and sit and make a long list of factors that may have contributed to this. And what's the sorting exercise you go through to determine and also then apply your own language that these four points really matter more than the size of Ethiopia? or the, the, the history of one country against the other, or you know the many, the 1,500 other reasons one could come up with mm. why this looks different. It also reminded me a bit of this idea of why nation fail, and this idea of explaining, you know, why is Latin America different <coughs> from the United States at this very high level? And I'm just curious to understand how, how does that land in your own work? Mm. Thanks. Do you want to take? Uh... Oh, there's one more there. I, I'd like to take groups of three, so if we can take that one. Hello, hi, my name is Kate. Um, I'm a visiting fellow here in the geography department. Um, I don't want to continue too much on the causality aspect, because I know that's um, something that's been mentioned a lot, and you might not want to talk about it <laughs> um, too much, but I am really interested in, in that, and I think Claire, when you said it was kind of this bold move, I found that kind of an interesting word as well. Um, so 
if the kind of the motivation of, of the book is to think about more just futures and kind of uh, better urban futures, why do you think causality is important in that context? And what does causality allow you to do that perhaps something else might not? Thanks. Okay. Great questions. <laughs> Uh, and really interesting questions, actually, um, because not least because I didn't think I was, I suppose I did say up there something about defensive causality, but I didn't sort of think that I was being really radical or, uh, you know, it's not like I don't bang on about it that much in the book. But to me, it just seems entirely natural to want to tell a causal story. That, that's the reality of it. And it might partly be from being here, like being somewhere like LSE, where, you know, to know the cause of things, where everybody was trying to explain something in their PhD. You know, you weren't just trying to um, reinterpret something or re-describe it or uh, do some kind of um, creative uh, work around, you know, some kind of agenda or normative question. That was not common here. It was very much people trying to explain empirical phenomena. So it seemed very natural to me. That, that's not to say it's the right thing, but it's, yeah, it, it wasn't, I didn't start out to go, I'm going to do something radical and look at causality. But I mean, I think the other thing, and again, probably just come back to the experience of being here and in the context of people who were still coming out of this decade of really critiquing new institutional economics and kind of good governance reforms, right? So reforms that were taken, uh, you know, sometimes with some local input, but basically developed by donors and promoted around the world about how cities and countries could be better governed and finding that they just didn't work the same way in the same places or that um, this also in a way speaks to your question Kate um, I think it you know there was a lot of focus on that in the context of my PhD and the work that's been going on here about why it, actually contrary to Asimoglu and Robinson and all this stuff on institutions um, you don't just need to get the institutions right it doesn't work there's much more than that going on uh, and a lot of that is, is um, there's been lots of work around how that's related to the politics as well as historical conditions. So it's this idea that um, you, need to understand, you need to understand causality because, you know, it, it helps you to understand why something you think might happen may not happen. You know, what, why certain policy reforms have failed in one place or succeeded in another. Um, why things go in one direction and in another place they go in a different direction if prodded with apparently the same stimuli or the same kind of inputs. But that seems to me very important because, you know, the whole of kind of attempting to bring about policy reforms or, or, or promote better urban futures is kind of based on the idea that, like, we will do this and we think it will have this effect. And a lot of the time it doesn't. So it's, yeah, it's very natural to me, I guess, to try and explore those questions of why here and not here, how do we understand um, and explain? It's basically to explain. So it's not, it's not just about describing or interpreting. It's an attempt to explain something. And this, this kind of goes back to your point, Philip, because it is also an interpretation. It's, it's, it's my, it, when I talked about distilling what I thought were the main causal factors, somebody else might well have done that differently. You know, I'm not taking myself out of this completely. And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm not. It's not a positivist study in the sense that it's neither fully interpretist nor positivist and that, that's why I draw on it, the influence of critical realism and I think being around a few people in my, my, my current context who were into critical realism was influential there which is the idea that you do have real causal factors but you can't see them in a transparent way you can't test for them you can't uncover them naturally you will do a lot of interpretation to try and uncover what they are but they are real so it's not just interpretation and it's not positivist it's not like what you see is what you get and, and in a sense, that's what's behind the approach. Um, yeah. Uh, to your question at the back about government structures, I mean, you've all identified key weaknesses in the book, basically. So I don't talk a lot about urban governance and all those formal processes and, and, and structures through which cities are governed, which I'm sure you're all learning about, many of you, and you know a lot about. It's not something I engage that much with. and that. Again, it's partly because I didn't believe it explained the differences, but I don't have time to kind of go through every other possible explanation. I've done a lot of it in my head and I've done a lot of it over the years saying, this doesn't work as an explanation because that, you know, if it, for example, the size of Ethiopia, well, you know, Nigeria is a similar size and that has completely different cities. So, you know, there are a lot of things that you kind of rule out, but again, you've exposed what 
is an obvious weakness that really didn't occur to me until after I've written the book, which is there's not a lot of discussion of methodology in that sense. In that, and there's, there's a lot of discussion of the kind of framework and the epistemological basis of it, in a way, but not of the process that I went through, which in a way I regret. But it was partly because it wasn't a discrete piece of research. When you do a piece of research, you tend to write out the methodology. It's because it was all these things together. It was more about a story I wanted to tell. Um, but yeah, maybe that's something I can write about in the future. Thanks. Has anyone else got questions? I do realize that um, we are standing between you and England and Wales. <laughs> oh, yeah. You've done well, guys. Not many people have left. But I think there's probably maybe not that many people from England and Wales who care that much about the <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say it's a, mi it's a minority sport in this room. Um, I just had uh, one comment, really, which is, um, and, and I think you say this, but I just wanted to reinforce it in a slightly different way that, you know, when I, when I first started reading urban studies, um, David Harvey was very influence, influential and was talking about the concrete manifestation of power as it was, as it is, and indeed how it would continue to be. But what I really love about what you've done is you've shown that that concrete manifestation of power is articulating all the time with a series of other kinds of powers. And I think that's a huge contribution where even though you don't identify as a southern urbanist, um, views from the south have really turned some of the principles of human geography uh, on their head. So I would like to congratulate you on, on that um, front as well. Having claimed him as a political scientist, uh -huh. I'm going to claim him as an urbanist. <laughs> OK, thanks very much, everyone. Um, I'd like to ask you to join me to, in thanking Claire Mercer, uh, James Putzel, and of course, Tom Goodfellow for a really entertaining and informative evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>